If you're wondering what happened to the American dream, you're looking at it. Walter and Cordelia Knott saw their incredible life together as a fulfillment of the American dream. They were the lead characters in the story of how a family farm became an international tourist attraction. Today, Knottberry Farm has over 40 rides and averages approximately 4 million visitors per year. So allow me to take you back in time and tell you the story of how Walter and Cordelia Knott founded the park. Walter's grandparents arrived in Southern California in 1868. After taking a long and hard journey from Texas in a covered wagon with their young daughter, Virginia, Walter's mother, Walter would one day love hearing stories from his grandmother about this very journey. In fact, they played a large role in forming his view of the American frontier, an image which would help shape Knott's Berry Farm into the place we all love to visit today. Walter's father, Reverend Elgin Knott, was a Southern Methodist minister who came to California in 1880 for health-related reasons. Nine years later, Walter Knott was born in San Bernardino, California on December the 11th, 1889. At this time, his father, now the owner of a 60-acre orange grove, was preaching in Orange County. Sadly, in 1896, Walter's father died of an accidental fall from a train step that badly injured his leg. After this tragedy, life was hard for Virginia and her now two sons, Walter and Elgin Jr. Three years after the death of Elgin, Virginia sold the orange grove and the family moved to Pomona, California. By the age of 10, Walter was already keen on the idea of one day becoming a farmer. He was actually already growing vegetables on vacant lots that he could rent and would sell some of the produce before school to help supplement his family's income. Walter would also sell newspapers after school and had a job cleaning a church once a week to help provide his mother with some much needed support. He only spent two years at high school and in 1908, he left to find work in the rich farmlands of the Imperial Valley. Not picked melons for a year and by 1909, he and a cousin had saved enough money for them to be able to lease 20 acres of land in the Coachella Valley. Through a lot of hard work, Walter was able to make the farm pay. But by 1910, Walter had moved back to Pomona and was now working for a local cement contractor. This job was better paid and paid well enough for Walter to be able to build a house in Pomona, which still stands to this day. On June 3rd, 1911, Walter married his high school sweetheart, Cordelia Harnaday. Cordelia had arrived in Pomona with her father and younger sister from Illinois in 1904. Her mother Martha had died when Cordelia was only 11 years old. This forced Cordelia to grow up quickly and become the homemaker of the family. This was where Cordelia first started to discover her talent for cooking. Despite Walter having a good job, he still dreamt of becoming a farmer. Then, in 1913, with newly born daughter Virginia, the Knotts moved to a homestead near Newbury Springs out on the Mojave Desert. Unfortunately, the dry desert climate proved impossible for growing crops, and after three and a half years of trying, Walter was forced to find another job. However, during this time, Walter was able to prove up his homestead enough that he was given the land by the government. They would own this land for the rest of their lives. Walter took a job as a carpenter in the silver mining town of Calico. He would love to walk through the town in the evenings and investigate the old abandoned buildings. By 1917, the Knotts had three children, two daughters and one son. This year also presented Knott with his next attempt at farming. A cousin had told him about a cattle ranch in the tiny town of Shandon in San Luis Obispo County that needed someone to grow produce to feed their workers. Walter took this opportunity. While Walter was farming, Cordelia would supplement the family income by making and selling homemade candy to a small general store in the town. In 1920, Jim Preston, another Another of Walter's cousins approached Walter with the idea of forming a partnership as tenant farmers. Walter loved this idea and he loaded up his Model T Ford just before Christmas and moved the family to Orange County. 
Preston and Knott then leased 20 acres at Buena Park and they started growing berries, the advanced blackberry at first. By 1922, the Knotts now had four children and the family was complete. A year later, Walter and Cordelia started selling some of their berries from a roadside berry stand to passing cars on Highway 39 in Buena Park, California. The original stand was not the famous stand that was eventually moved to Knott's Berry Farm. The original was just a lean-to sheltered with palm fronds and a cigar box for a cash register. It would be a year later that the famous stand was built. By 1924, the farm was now 35 acres in size, and by 19 25, the farm was growing a huge variety of berries, as well as other fruit and vegetables. Knott and Preston now had 50 pickers working for them, but still none worked quite as hard as Walter Knott. The lease ended at Buena Park in 1927, and with this, so did the partnership between Knott and Preston. However, Walter was now more determined than ever to own his own farm, and this is exactly what he did. Walter Knott acquired 10 acres of land for $1,500 an acre. Not did not have enough money for an initial down payment, but he was able to agree to a rent-to-own agreement which would allow him to finally own the land. Not stuck to this agreement even after land prices fell drastically during the Great Depression. When asked about the farm, Not said, we had good land and enough water, and we are going to have the finest berry farm in California and we are willing to study, learn, and work hard, and do without to get it. Knott's Berry Place, an 80-foot-long structure, was built by Walter and opened in 1928. The structure included a nursery, a berry market, and a small tea room. At the back of the building was the Knott's family home. The tea room was where Cordelia could sell sandwiches, fresh bait rolls with jam, berry pie, and ice cream during the harvest season. The tea room was designed so that their home kitchen opened up into the tea room itself. The farm itself now spanned 50 acres, and Walter was growing 30 varieties of berries here. George Darrow of the US Department of Agriculture came to visit Walter Knott one day in 1932 to tell him about a widely unknown berry, the Boysen berry. George Darrow took Walter to see Rudolf Boysen, an Anaheim Park superintendent, who at this time only had a few scraggly boysenberry plants left on his land. Rudolph allowed Walter to take a few cuttings, and through Walter's great farming ability, he was able to start growing the boysenberry himself. By 1933, Walter Knott had grown his first small crop of boysenberries, and by the next year, he was able to grow enough to sell 2,200 baskets of the berries. The boysenberry is a cross between the red raspberry, the blackberry, and the loganberry. Walter Knott knew that this berry could be a great commercial success as it tasted great, it took half as many of them to fill a carton compared to the young berry, and yet a carton could be sold for twice as much. Cordelia also started to sell her now world-famous boysenberry pie in the tea rooms this year. By now, many Americans were deeply struggling due to the implications of the Great Depression. The Depression caused crop prices to fall, but the Knots were able to survive during this time, mainly due to their hard work, determination, and the flexibility of their rent-to-own agreement on the land. To further support the family, Cordelia Knott served her first eight chicken dinners on her own wedding china for 65 cents each. At this time, she had no idea how greatly this moment would impact her and her family's life. In 1937, Walter Knott was growing four acres of boysenberries, and the business had grown big enough to stay open year-round, freezing berries to meet their needs for the rest of the year. And the chicken dinner was now an established item on the menu, and it had become so popular that Walter actually had to expand the restaurant. The restaurant was the only place to eat on the drive between LA and Newport, and in the first year of operation, Cordelia Knott served over 265,000 chicken dinners from her own kitchen. In late 1938, Walter built the beautiful rock garden next to the restaurant, and his son Russell set up a display of fluorescent minerals that he had collected on his many trips to the desert. Visitors could turn on a black light to make the colours of the minerals leap out. 
In another room, Walter put a collection of music boxes on display. In 1939, Walter added a new wing to the west side of the restaurant, which could now seat up to 600 people, but this did present a problem. Walter Knott explained in an interview that there was a real eyesore right outside of the new room's windows. This was an unsightly standpipe that stood some 10 or 12 feet high. The Knotts had to irrigate their fields and the standpipe was a very necessary part of this irrigation system, so there was no way that it could be eliminated. They just had to figure out a way to make it look attractive. Not spent several days analysing the problem, trying to think of every possible solution. And then, once he just stopped thinking about it, the idea came to him one morning while shaving. Not decided to make a volcano out of it and put a desert cactus garden all around. Built of 18 tonnes of volcanic rock, Pulled in from the Fisga Mountains on the Mojave Desert, the volcano featured a boiler to create steam and a rumbling noise machine. They planted some Joshua trees and some cactus all around, and there was even a little red devil who turned the crank to make it go. Despite the expansion to the restaurant, customers were still waiting hours in line to get a table, and Walter Knott wanted to entertain his guests while they waited. So to try to solve this issue, he came up with the idea of Ghost Town. Ghost Town was inspired by Walter's love for the Old West, and the pioneering spirit of the time, much of which he learned about through the stories told by his grandmother about their wagon trip from Texas to Southern California. The first building Walter bought for Ghost Town was the Gold Trails Hotel from Prescott, Arizona, which was originally built in 1868. Ghost Town was open in time for berry season in 1941, and by 1942, Ghost Town had grown to the point where Knott's Berry Place was now a fully-fledged roadside attraction. On Ghost Town, Walter said that our thought is to collect a town, but as that is impossible, we try to do the next best thing. Some of the earliest buildings to be built in Ghost Town include the blacksmith's shop, the sheriff's office, Ghost Town Jail, and Goldie's Place. Knott's Berry Place was officially renamed Knott's Berry Farm and Ghost Town in 1947. By now, Walter and Cordelia Knott's children were a big part of running the farm. Their daughters helped in the restaurant and in 1946, Marianne and Tony started to run a new dress and sports shop built on site. Russell, their son, ran the berry market while Virginia now ran the gift shop. The daughter's husbands also took key roles in helping run Knott's Berry Farm. By the 1950s, Ghost Town consisted of dozens of shops and attractions, including Panning for Gold, the Stagecoach Ride, the Calico Saloon, and the General Merchandise Store. By 1951, Walter Knott bought America's last operating narrow gauge railroad, the Denver and Rio Grande, and moved it entirely to Knott's Berry Farm. The inaugural run of the railroad in 1952 was attended by Walt and Lillian Disney, who received a personal invite from Knott. Disney and Knott were good friends all the way up until Disney's death. The same year, Walter purchased the 70-acre Calico Ghost Town in San Bernardino County with the aim of restoring it. Fifteen years later, Walter deeded Calico to the county as a recreational centre and park. The famous Berry Shack was moved to Ghost Town in 1952, and it opened selling boysenberry punch, coffee, and ice cream. The Ghost Town School, originally built in Beloit, Kansas in 1876, also opened this same year. Due to the friendship between Knott and Disney previously mentioned, Walter and Cordelia attended the grand opening of Disneyland. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. They were both concerned that having Disneyland nearby would negatively impact attendance at Knott's Berry Farm, but they went anyway to support their friend. However, their concerns were not valid as attendance actually increased at Knott's Berry Farm due to the increase in tourists now visiting the area. The opening of Disneyland did still mean more competition, and Walter and Cordelia Knott would spend hours in his office trying to think of new ways to improve the park and one such improvement was the addition in 1960 of the now famous and iconic Calico Mine Ride. 
One of Walter's proudest achievements was the completion of Independence Hall, which included an exact replica of the cracked Liberty Bell. At the opening in 1966, Knott told a reporter, I'm humbled by being able to do this. It took 15 years to build the original Independence Hall, but the form of government which was conceived in that original building gave us an economic system which allowed this brick by brick reconstruction to be completed in seven months. Knott's Berry Farm continued to grow in the 1960s. The park started to charge admission in 1968, and the brilliant Calico Log Ride opened the following year. In 1968, Walter passed creative control of the park onto his daughter, Marion. Through all the changes and growth of the farm, Walter and Cordelia would always eat their dinner together in their very own dining room at 5pm. Cordelia would do the cooking, and Walter would do the washing up. Sadly, on April the 23rd, 1974, at the age of 84, Cordelia Nott passed away. Cordelia had still worked in the chicken dinner restaurant up until the early 70s. She prided herself on creating a homely, comfortable atmosphere in her restaurant, and cooking great food from the day it opened to the day she left. Cordelia lived in her house, the one built on the farm, in 1928 up until the day she died. Unfortunately, due to both of their deteriorating health issues, Walter moved out of the house a few years earlier. Due to him slipping into Parkinson's disease, he required his rooms to be kept cool, but Cordelia needed the rooms to be warm for her comfort and so Walter moved into a double-wide mobile home nearby. Walter was never the same after Cordelia's passing. When asked about their relationship, Walter would always give Cordelia huge credit for the couple's success. Saying that, Cordelia and I have always worked as a team. I apply the gas and she applies the brakes. After Cordelia's passing, Walter left park operations to his children and turned his attention further towards political causes. Politically, Walter Knott believed that free enterprise was the pathway to the American dream, a dream he believed he fulfilled in his life through hard work, education, and determination. He resisted government growth and liked to quote Thomas Jefferson, saying that, as government expands, freedom gives away. In terms of his political beliefs impacting how he ran Knott's Berry Farm, he believed it was his responsibility to look after his employees as it was just the right thing to do. A few years ago when I was driving a mule up and down these berry roads, I little dreamed that I would be getting an award here from the Academy of Country and Western Music. Thank you. From the 1940s, Knott offered a profit-sharing plan and health insurance to all his employees. Knott continued to live in the double-wide trailer inside the farm until he passed away on December 3, 1981, just a few days before his 92nd birthday. Walter was buried at Loma Vista Cemetery in Fullerton, California, next to his beloved wife. Walter and Cordelia's children and grandchildren continued to run Knott's Berry Farm until 1997 when they sold the park to the Cedar Fair Entertainment Company. And today, the park is still going strong. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed learning the story of Walter and Cordelia Knott and would love to hear if you have any personal fond memories of Knott's Berry Farm. Also, please leave a like on this video, subscribe to our channel, check out some of our other videos and the links in the description.